Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. We've got one of those stories here. It's creating a firestorm across all news outlets. And I hate this story. I hate this story in the sense that something happened that was so avoidable that I look at it and go, oof. And many attorneys like myself are looking at it going, oof. This could have been resolved so much simpler. But unfortunately, it wouldn't have made the news then, would it have? So here we go. I'm going to go with a headline from Reason.com, which of course is the one that summarizes it best. Police traveled 500 miles to seize girl's pet goat for slaughter. So it involves a pet goat, a nine-year-old girl, and the police. And it's reminiscent of the police on that Batmobile wild goose chase cross-country, where you look at it and go, is this really a job for the police? But we'll, we'll get to that because other mistakes were made. And, and I'm talking about screw-ups of a monumental proportion. So this video is going to be a bit longer because I'm going to get into some legal issues towards the end that we've never addressed on this channel. But uh, Joe Lancaster's version of this for Reason.com says a nine-year-old backed out of a deal to sell her pet goat for slaughter. So local officials and the sheriff's deputies used the power of the state to force her to go through with it. That is, they grabbed the goat and the goat is no more. A uh, federal civil lawsuit now, of course, has been filed that alleges that sheriff's deputies from Shasta County, California, traveled across the state to seize a little girl's beloved pet goat for slaughter. New reporting details how they may have violated the law in doing so. And oh yes, yes, this is where it gets interesting. The lawsuit's been filed recently, but the story happened back in June of last year. A woman and her daughter, who is nine years old, attended the Shasta District Fair. Now, that fair includes a junior livestock auction in which members of 4-H youth programs exhibit farm animals that they have raised. At the end, the animals are sold at an auction to the highest bidders, and it is known that they're being sold for their meat. So you go to a fair and you buy a goat, you buy a cow, you buy whatever, and it's anticipated that that animal's not going home to be your pet. And so people understand that. And then after the livestock is auctioned off, the high bidder gets the livestock and the fair gets a 7% commission on the auction. In April, the woman purchased a goat for her daughter and her daughter named the goat Cedar. Now, I've had several people point out after I did the video about the potential law change in Canada in one province that says that in a custody dispute, Pets will be treated differently than animals. And I got some very, very angry emails, including one from a guy who said, Steve, dogs aren't people. You got to keep stop, you know, you got to stop saying that. And I, I never said that. I simply said that pets, the animals we keep in our homes and live with and name, are a different class of property than inanimate objects, for example. Okay? So uh, you have to understand that people do actually keep animals as pets. And whether it was wise for a nine-year-old girl to have a pet goat that uh, the plan was to bring to the uh, 4-H auction, I, I'm not going to get into that because that's not really the point here. The point is how the adults here handle the situation. So from then, that is April when she got the pet goat, uh, until the fair, the daughter fed and cared for Cedar every day. She bonded with the animal just as she would have bonded with a puppy and loved him as a family pet. At the fair, a state senator was the high bidder on the goat, and he bid $902. Now, I've had several versions of the story that I've seen that make him out to be the bad guy. But there are some things that he has said that indicate that it might not be right to point the finger at him. However... When he bid his $902, the mother already had second thoughts about this because her daughter didn't want the goat to be sold and, and slaughtered. So the daughter and her mother tried to withdraw Cedar from the auction, but they were told that the rules didn't allow it. After the auction, the uh, little girl stayed with the goat, and she was quite upset. At this point, before any money changed hands, the mother and her daughter sought to terminate the contract. 
And as Joe Lancaster points out, California law allows that a contract of a minor may be disaffirmed. And what they're getting at is a concept of a voidable contract. And this is the first thing we have to look at. Because we don't know who signed the contract. Was the contract signed by the mother or the daughter or both? I don't know how 4-H auctions work. But you should know that when a minor signs a contract, the law says, in essence, in most states, that because you're a minor, you might not have full capacity to enter into a legally binding contract. Therefore, anybody who does that does so at their own peril, knowing that they might be bound by the contract, but that the minor is not. So a voidable contract is a legal contract that may be affirmed or rejected by a party. And uh, one example they give you is a contract by a minor. And so if you're going to say, Steve, that's not fair, well, no, you know that when you draft a contract and ask a nine-year-old to sign it. So I don't know if she signed the contract, but if she had, she's allowed to disaffirm that contract. Absolutely. With no penalty to her. Meanwhile, the mother told representatives of the fair that she would happily pay the 7% commission that would have resulted from the sale, $63.14. So she's saying, I'll give you guys the money so you won't lose any money. And then she took the goat home. Anticipating controversy, she later took the goat to another farm a couple hundred miles away. In the following days, the livestock manager of the Shasta District Fair and Event Center, which is a state agency that runs the fair, called the mother and told her that if she did not return the goat, he would have her charged with felony grand theft. So the mother offered to let the fair association keep the entire $902, but but they would not budge. She also reached out to the politician who was the high bidder, and he agreed that he would not resist the woman's efforts to save Cedar. So when she reached out to the high bidder and said, look, I'm in the situation. He said, oh, okay, I'll work with you. So it appears that the only people who were upset here were the people running the fair who were told that they'd be paid that money by somebody else if necessary. In other words, the mother paid the money instead of... So the fair wasn't going to lose any money. And this is a dangerous game to play. If you're involved in a legal situation and someone offers to make you whole, you got to take a long, hard look at it because if you wind up in court later going, Your Honor, they owe me money. A judge is going to look at you and go, but couldn't you have accepted that money back there and been made whole then instead of wasting all of our time or before sending police on a wild goose chase? So you got to be real careful about that. So he actually said he would not resist her efforts to save Cedar. He said, I'll work with you on that. In an email to the Fair Association, the mother wrote of her efforts to make it right with the buyer and the fairgrounds, mentioning that the guy who was the high bidder was supporting her, and the mother offered to pay for the goat and any other expenses I caused. So now she said, not only will I pay for the goat, I'll pay more if necessary, suggesting that, like, let's suppose they go, oh, now we've got legal fees which they didn't. But let's suppose they said that. We'll pay for those too. How do you complain or object when somebody says, I will make you whole, and you instead say, it can't be done. Money won't do it. We need that goat. This brings us to point number two. Are are goats fungible? I've talked about this before. There are certain things in life that are fungible, meaning that if I said, I'm going to bring you uh, uh, baseball, you go, okay, And I bring you a baseball, and it's one of the baseballs that's approved by Major League Baseball, and it's in a box, brand new baseball. You go, oh, I wasn't wanting that baseball. I wanted this baseball. What's the difference? Well, there's no difference. They're all the same. (laughs) Well, then they're fungible. Question is, are goats fungible? Now, several people right now are hammering away at the keyboard going, Steve, yes, they are. And, And I know that. Livestock, by definition, is another thing that's actually fungible. If you read the, uh, the reports and the financial pages of the newspaper, if you still get one of those, you'll see that there's stocks and bonds and mutual funds, and uh, somewhere back it has livestock. How much pork is selling for? How much beef is selling for? How m- 
by the pound, okay? So if you contracted with somebody to provide you a goat that weighed so many pounds, guess what? One goat's the same as another. Unless you're the little girl who owned her. And that's the issue. So to the fair, goats are fungible. To the little girl, they're not. So the fair should have said, gee, we thought that was such a special goat that it sold for $900. Can you replace that goat of like size and quality? And the mother could have said yes, but they didn't ask. They actually pretended like this goat was unique. This was the super goat. They had to have this goat. They had to. So she said she'd make it right with the buyer, who she spoke to, and any other expenses I caused. However, the CEO of the Fair Association was unmoved, who wrote her back that while she was not unsympathetic, (laughs) gotta love the double negative, Please understand the fair industry is set up to teach our youth responsibility and for the future generations of ranchers and farmers to learn the process and effort it takes to raise quality meat. Making an exception for you will only teach our youth that they do not have to abide by the rules that are set up for all participants. Well, it'll also teach the youth that minors sign contracts that are voidable, which is what the law is. So... The weird part is, it appears this woman is saying, I'm trying to teach your daughter a lesson. It's good for her. (laughs) She concluded it was out of my hands, and the mother would need to bring the goat back to the Shasta District Fair immediately. Now, according to the Sacramento Bee, that fair director then emailed an official with the state's Department of Food and Agriculture saying that an organizer of a local community barbecue has contacted her lawyer's regarding the theft of the goat donated to the barbecue. So they said the goat was stolen. And you always wonder if they actually laid out the real facts or if they spun them. So in other words, someone calls the police, police show up, hey ma'am, we're here, what's going on? Did they say, well, this little girl's goat was entered in the 4-H and at the end of the 4-H show, They're auctioned off and high bidder gets to get it. And obviously, you know, the goat's not going to a farm to live out the rest of its life naturally. It's going to get barbecued. And the little girl changed her mind. And so the mom, in an attempt to take care of her little girl, uh, corresponded with the buyer, corresponded with us, says that she's willing to pay whatever damages are necessary, but they want to keep the goat. So she took the goat and uh, we, we want you to go fetch that goat. Would the police have responded to that the same as if they'd simply been told someone stole this goat? Because they've contacted lawyers regarding the theft of the goat. So two weeks after the fair, Shasta Sheriff's detective sought and received a search warrant directing two officers to drive more than 500 miles in order to seize the goat and return him to Shasta County. I apologize, I may have said her earlier. The warrant authorized the search of a goat rescue in Napa County, but the goat was not there. After searching the rescue, officers then drove over to Sonoma County and took cedar from a farm that was not listed in the warrant. Now, it's another story altogether, but there is some debate about this because the police say when they showed up and said, is this goat here? The owner of the farm said, yeah, you can come get the goat. That's what they say happened, but... They say no warrant was necessary to retrieve cedar at that farm as they'd consent from the property owner. Now, in an amended complaint filed in February, the mother claims the officers were then required by law to hold a cedar or deliver him to a magistrate so that the court could determine cedar's ownership. But instead, they independently deemed unknown third parties to be the owners of cedar and delivered him back to the fairgrounds. And this is one of the things that we have to talk about. I talked about the concept of interpleader a week or two back, where I said, if there is a thing people are fighting over, okay? And I'll give you the example they often give in law school. You're driving down the road one day and a suitcase is in the middle of your lane, a a, a Samsonite hard-sided suitcase, and, and you run it over and it gets stuck underneath your car. 
You pull over to the side of the road. By the way, this is not the exact example to give in law school. I'm dressing it up to make it more interesting. You're driving along and you hit this suitcase. So you pull over to the side of the road, you pull it out, and as you pull it out, it flips open and it's filled with cash. Wads and wads of cash. It looks like this, okay? Cash, cash, bundles of cash, mountains of cash. How much cash can you jam in a suitcase? And you open it up and you go, wow. Problem, of course, is that as you open it up, a small crowd gathers and people know that you've got this money. And by the time you get to your house for some weird reason, your phone's ringing off the hook and people are saying, that's mine. That's mine. So you're not sure what to do with it. So somebody goes, why do you call the police? Well, the problem, of course, if you give it to the police, they're going to seize it and say it's civil asset forfeiture. And that would take the fun out of the story. So what you can do with something like this is you can actually take it to a court and give it to a judge and say, there you go, Your Honor. It's your, it's your problem now. It's called interpleader. Interpleader is where you take something, figuratively speaking, to a court and make it the court's problem. Let the court sort it out. Because you and I both know that if you take 20 phone calls and you decide that one of those people is telling the truth and you give it to them, the other 19 people are going to sue you. So you divide it up among all 20 of them. <laughs> all the people who you didn't give money to are going to sue you. You can't win. You can't win. So when people are fighting over something, a goat, believe it or not, you hold the goat and you notify the court and say, we've got something here that people are fighting over because we think it should go to this guy over here. Although he's told these people he doesn't mind if they keep the goat, they want the goat. And there's also a little girl involved who may or may not have signed a voidable contract. Um, at what point now do we think we're safe giving this goat to somebody? And yet they went ahead and took care of it their way. And I've said this before, self-help is fraught with peril. If you have a judicial remedy, that is something you can do in a court, and instead you take it upon yourself to fix the problem yourself, you better be sure you're right. Because somewhere down the road, you're going to be asked by a judge just this question. Why didn't you save the goat just long enough for us to resolve this issue? Because if you ain't right with what you chose to do, you're in a heap of trouble. So... In an amended complaint, the mother says the officers should have delivered the goat to the magistrate so that the court could figure out who owns the goat. Perplexingly, the mother is not even certain what actually happened to Cedar at this point. At this time, we don't have that specific information. We can only speculate, her attorney said. While it hasn't been confirmed as a factual matter, we believe that the goat has been killed. Now, the mom and her daughter admittedly sought to terminate a contract. It's hard to imagine a worse state response at any stage of the process. If both the mother and the high bidder agreed to terminate the contract and the mother agreed to reimburse the fare, then who was harmed? Who was harmed? Now, that's the version of the story by Joe Lancaster of Reason. LA Times had a, another story that contains some extremely important information. Because like I said, a lot of people were bashing the guy who was the high bidder because they said, oh, he's a politician and he bought the goat and he's trying to teach that little girl a lesson. The mother offered to repay the fair district and the bidder whatever costs had been incurred. That included the winning bid of $902 made by a state senator and the 7% cut that the fair was entitled to, which was $63.14. In... Her June 27th letter to the fair director, the mother pointed out that she had already been in contact with the man's office about his bid and that a representative told her the lawmaker was okay with the alternative solution of the goat getting to be donated to a farm that does weed abatement. So apparently they were discussing what other options are there. One, you send the goat to slaughter. Two, the goat comes home as a pet. Is the woman going to really let her daughter raise this goat as a pet for however long goats live? And I don't know how long lived goats are. But, or will this goat have to go live someplace eventually? And the mother and the daughter had apparently discussed, we can find someplace where the goat can just go and live as a goat. 
And so apparently they discussed this topic and, and the senator said, sure. State senator said, sure, go right ahead. So meanwhile, the officials argue that they were simply trying to hold the girl, the nine-year-old girl, to her agreement. Uh, it's noted that under California law, a minor can withdraw from a contract within a reasonable amount of time. And um, it's pointed out here that a child can't be held the same standard as an adult can. So when she wanted out, she had an absolute right. Let's get down to this. Number one, we don't know who signed the contract. If that little girl signed the contract, she can void the contract. Nine-year-old girl. Uh, I've handled cases involving voided contracts before. Voidable contracts before. And I've had it where a client of mine signed a contract as a minor and uh, something went wrong. And I contacted the other side of the contract. I said, well, we went out of the contract. They said, you can't get out. Signed a contract. I said, you know how old my client is? And what's funny is I've spoken to people before who said, I don't care how old your client is. I said, call your attorney. <laughs> Watch what your attorney says. But the other real question, I suppose, is who owned the goat? Because the goat was owned by the little girl. See, she can own stuff. It's just a question whether she can sign binding contracts that you can't get out of. But here is the other thing. And I mentioned interpleader, which is what they should have done. They should have, if they wanted to go get the goat, they could have gone and gotten the goat and then said, we're going to go to court to decide ownership. They also could have just said, we're going to go to court and decide ownership. We don't need to have the goat in our possession to do that. They could have done that also. But one other thing that I have to point out, and this is getting to a legal concept I've only mentioned in passing once or twice before, but in law school, you take a class called Remedies. Remedies. And you may notice there's a hole in the bookshelf down here because this is my Remedies book from law school. I kid you not. And you'll notice it still has my name written and highlighted. It's long since faded. And inside, the reason it's so thick is after each case in here is the handwriting and the brief I wrote for the particular case that we were discussing that day. And remedies, simply put, is the study of what you can get uh, as a resolution to a contract legally if forced to go to court and get a resolution. So most commonly we think of a remedy as damages, cash damages. So I have a, I have a contract with you and I breached that contract and my breach caused you $100 in harm. Your damages are $100. You can sue me for $100. You get your $100 back. You've been made whole. That's the theory. That's the theory. However, you might know that there are certain types of contracts that cannot be remedied with money. Money does not cure all ills. So there's a concept called specific performance. Specific performance. And a brief summary would be that it's a contractual remedy which the court orders a party to actually perform its promise as closely as possible because monetary damages are somehow inadequate. And so I'm not saying that the court could have ordered specific performance here, but I'm simply pointing out that not all damages are monetary. So give you an example. Let's suppose there's this beautiful piece of property on a lake. It's on an island. In fact, it is an island. There's an island and a lake. <laughs> it's your favorite lake on earth, and there's an island in the middle of it. An island is for sale. You put down some money, sign a, sign a legally binding contract. You're an adult, they're an adult. And you sign a contract to buy that island. Put some money down. You start doing stuff, preparing to move to the island. And somebody comes along and goes, hey, do you sell that island to that guy? And the seller goes, yeah, why? Oh, I'll pay you more for it if you break the contract with them. Oh, okay, sure. And the person breaks the contract with you because they can make more money selling to this other person. But you have a legally binding contract. Now, you could run to court and ask for cash damages. What are your damages when you buy a unique piece of real estate that cannot be duplicated? It's not money. The only real remedy here is to give you that island. Yeah, you have to pay for it, but, but to make the seller go through the original contract. So you can go to court and ask for specific performance. I want the court to order that seller to sell me that island as per the terms of our agreement. And a court would look at that and go, well, you know, best example of specific performance is something that's unique and that is often real estate or another example, a piece of art. 
let's suppose that you uh, were the high bidder uh, on, a, on, a, on a masterpiece, uh, a, a Da Vinci. You, you were the high bidder on a Da Vinci. And uh, after the auction was over, somebody approached the auctioneer and goes, hey, I'll flip you ten, $10 more than he paid you. Give it to me. Oh, okay, here you go. <laughs> you can go to court, get specific performance, and deliver that piece to you once you pay for it. That's how specific performance works. So whenever you look at a situation, and I'm talking about this as an attorney thinks, when you look at this whole situation in front of you, you discuss who's got the legal rights and obligations and what could play out over here and all that stuff. One of the things you should also look at is what are the damages? What are the damages? And what are the remedies? What are the remedies? And so if you go back to the fair director's position and she said, somehow it's going to make us look bad or hurt us or something if you don't go through with this contract. What's the harm? What is, what is her harm if that contract gets breached? Well, you recall the contract is one of sale created at an auction. So what's the harm if that contract gets breached? Well, the harm is they lose their commission. The woman said she'd pay their commission. Boom, there goes that argument. Well, the guy who bought the goat could say, that goat's unique, I want that goat. But he's already said he doesn't care. So he's not harmed. So you look at this and go, okay, wait a second. These damages were all purely cash damages. In other words, if you let her keep the goat and she paid money, these people are all made whole. And you get back to what the woman said at the fair. She said, the fair industry is set up to teach our youth responsibility. She was actually saying, this isn't about the goat. It's not about the money. We're trying to teach, in essence, your kid a lesson. And number one, that's not a harm that you can enforce in court. What are, what are your damages if this woman and her child refuse to learn the lesson of youth responsibility? That's not what this is supposed to be about. So the damages of the situation where the woman takes the goat for her daughter and spirits the goat away, let's assume that was completely wrong. Let's assume for a moment it's completely wrong. What are the damages? The value of the goat. Now you might say, Steve, you're not supposed to steal stuff. You're not supposed to, if I, if, I, if I came into your studio and stole that cup you've got on your desk for some weird reason, you wouldn't say, gee, just pay me the cost of the cup. And I wouldn't. I wouldn't. But this is not a simple, straight-up theft case. If somebody came onto the people's property at night and kidnapped the goat, that's one thing. But here, they openly said, we took the goat. We're willing to compensate you for the goat. That's not the same as someone coming by and stealing the goat that you don't know, and they just stole the goat for the fun of it or a college prank. We don't know. So that's obviously not the same thing. And then it gets us down to when someone calls the police and says, we've got this situation. Can you go and retrieve a goat for us? It's going to involve you guys driving 500 miles. Uh, you get back to the wasted resources of our government. Kind of like going to Indiana to investigate a Batmobile constructor. Uh, so, I don't know. But, when I look at this, and yes, a federal lawsuit's been filed. Federal lawsuit's been filed against the people who run that fair. And all I look at is that one sentence. The fair industry is set up to teach our youth responsibility. And I don't think that's necessarily your only job here. And you have to understand, yeah, a lot of people right now have already typed and hit enter and posted saying, you know, this is what happens when a nine-year-old girl has a pet goat that she got for the 4-H because a lot of the animals that pass through the 4-H program don't live long and happy lives beyond that program. And I understand that. I understand that. And, and a lot of people are going to say that. But I also know from living on this earth for the few decades I've been here, that people are different from one another. And some people, emotionally, 
uh, grow up at different rates than other people. I've met very mature eight-year-olds. I've met very immature 14-year-olds. Heck, I've met immature 50-year-olds. <laughs> and who knows how to raise their daughter best? Their mother of the daughter or the officials at the Shasta County 4-H? <laughs> I don't know, but I suspect that you would think you know the answer to that. And so would they have to make an exception here? Yeah. Would it hurt anybody? No. But, but, and this is the important thing, was there a better way to handle this? Yes, there was. The better way to handle it would have been to either work out a deal where she gets to keep the goat or go to court and say, hey, this person grabbed a goat. It's not theirs. They should pay us for it, except they've already offered to pay. Or file a truthful police report and say, this nine-year-old girl entered her goat in the fair and then changed her mind after it was auctioned off. And we think the goat has now been stolen wrongfully. The police would then take a look at that, turn it over to a prosecutor who would say, wait, let me get this straight. Nine-year-old signed a contract? Okay. Do we really want to prosecute her and her mother for the goat absconding? And I don't think it would have gone much beyond that. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, and by the way, take heart, all you 4-H directors across the country, self-help is fraught with peril. I had a professor who actually had us all repeat that at least once. and goes, everybody in the class, one time, self-help is fraught with peril. And so when you decide to take the law in your own hands, which they warn you against at the end of people's court, you run the risk of a big federal lawsuit and headlines making the news internationally, such as this one, which, by the way, this isn't the craziest one I saw. I saw some that were even more over the top. But Joe Lancaster, by the way, I'm not saying it's over the top with respect. It's true. It's absolutely true. I'm talking about the, uh, the clickbait nature of a, of a headline to get your attention. From Reason.com, police traveled 500 miles to seize a girl's pet goat for slaughter. And that's what you get. So again, questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Leto's Law. You can't conquer a mountain, but it may conquer you.